Hello everybody, MinMax Munchking back with another video. First order of business as usually, patron shoutouts. So Mike, Matthew, Ewing, Larry Hawk and Bartley Man Hardly Trying. Rogor, Jared Henderson, Calaron, Suburban Hell, Frank Fenn, Albert Quack, Eden Hard, Dark Sin, Gary Kors, Brad Olham, Jolice Alcazar, Brad Vinia Boy Fox, Brian Moten, Sean, Guys, Manazi Stefano, Clea de Quazeb, Maccabi, Nathan James, Primal Bass, Booze, Bitten by Kyle Shikes, Trevor Green, Gaston Ramirez, Jordan Smith, Bassett, Lloyd, Lord Gazda, Devin, Yak, Jack, whatever its surname is, Twain Hudgens, and Lunatic Dragon. Uh, thank you all new and old patrons, I probably butchered half of your names, so I apologize, but I just don't know how a lot of these are pronounced, so you will have to, uh, you know, accept my apology, I believe. Uh, for all of you who are not on this list, uh, there is an optional, non-mandatory option to chuck a buck my way. Uh, you don't have to do it, but it's always uh, open in there, and if, if you're interested in... Uh, in some of these other tiers, you get certain perks, particularly all of my latest uh, uh, character builds and these uh, subclass and class overviews, reviews. I, I upload these notes and files on my Patreon page and you can download them there uh, as perks for these tiers. With that said, let's jump right into the meat of this video, which is gonna be the... Sort of like, uh, at this point, month-old uh, Unearthed Arcana, which got released last month. For Fighter, Ranger and Rogue, all three classes receiving one new subclass option, subclass playtest material. First in this list, obviously, as you can see, is Fighter with its Rune Knight uh, subclass option. That would, based on the general theme and flavor um, and vibe and all of its features, would definitely fit uh, Storm King's Thunder. One uh, as the primary campaign that I would see this subclass uh, used in, or pretty much any other campaign setting that features that heavily features giants. Uh, Rune knights come equipped with a multitude of magical features that, similar to eldritch knights, use intelligence to boost their martial capabilities, but don't directly directly tie into the established spellcasting system. Instead, uh, the magic of runes is, an is ancient and mysterious, just like the giants. Uh, first and foremost, you get the bonus proficiencies, uh, which is mostly a ribbon feature, but it's almost expected for a class that borrows magic from giants to know their language. And smith's tools might have a situational, but relevant utility if and when repairing broken or damaged weapons or armor. Uh, rune magic, uh, another level 3 feature, you start out with two of these runes, what they call rune options, uh, that you inscribe after a long rest on your weapons, armor and shields. Each piece of armor and or weaponry can bear only one rune, and if you screw up with the rune selection, or you just don't like the ones that you picked for some reason, uh, don't ha you don't have to worry, you can swap them every time you level up in this class. Uh, now, let's talk about these rune options. Uh, there is basically one rune option for each type of giant currently in the game. Mechanically, these options don't necessarily resemble the traits in the actual giant stat blocks, but they do make some sense in terms of like theme and flavor. Uh, Hog, I hope I pronounce these correctly, maybe I should have Google translated some of these to check whether they have any resemblance to actual Germa Germanic or Nordic runes. But anyway, Hog or Hill rune makes you more likely to resist poison condition and take only half poison damage. Additionally, once per short rest you get to activate sort of like a rage, rage type of resistance similar to barbarians to bludgeoning, piercing and slashing damage for one minute. Uh, considering how physical damage is the most likely type of damage at lower levels, it's quite solid option in tier 1 and even tier 2 of character progression, especially due to fighters higher armor class compared to barbarians. Barbarians usually have like 14 to 15 AC. Uh, fighters can easily go up to 18, even 20, depending on your um, dungeon master and what type of uh, gear it gives you, he, he or she gives you. So, uh, yeah, this definitely makes sense, you know, 
the first line of defense is your armor class and then whatever damage gets through that only gets halved uh, using this um, rune. So I think this is pretty potent. This is one of the top choices in my mind. Eild or fire rune gives you expertise with all tools you're proficient in, which is nice thing to have on a class that doesn't have that many uses out of combat. I mean, the name fighter pretty much implies that you are first and foremost interested in combat capabilities. Uh, once per short rest you can also invoke a rune after you hit a creature, which then makes a strength saving throw. Uh, on a fail, a little bit of extra fire damage is nice, uh, but the restraint condition is the real gem in my opinion, uh, as it simultaneously makes it easier for your allies to hit, to hit the target and harder for the target, for the enemy, to hit you or your allies back. It also makes fireballs better due to disadvantage on deck saves. Restraint condition obviously imposes disadvantage on deck saves. This rune is actually best used when there are as many of your allies between you and the enemy on the initiative tracker. So if you opt to learn and use it, make sure you and your party prioritize targets carefully uh, based on your relative positioning in the initiative tracker. Um, Ise, Ice, Ice, Frost Rune, whatever it's pronounced, makes you a bit better at dealing with animals and being scary, obviously, due to these proficiencies. Uh, but the main bonus is a 10 minute increase to strength uh, by 2, which you can invoke once per short rest. Now, most of these, pretty much all of these runes have a, like a permanent bonus and then once, uh, once a short rest uh, boon benefit that you can activate mostly using your action if i'm not mistaken um but yeah basically the 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 plus two the plus one bonus to accuracy and damage and athletics uh, is nice but sadly it's not as good as other rune buffs at least in my opinion you might get good mileage out of this particular rune if you are playing in a i don't know like a, a dungeon crawl or there might be multiple small scuffles and skirmishes during the 10 minutes duration of the rune. You might get good mileage. Even then, like, it's pretty much better to have even, like, hog hill rune. Because at least one of those combats you will be able to take a considerable amount of abuse and, and keep above uh, zero hit points. Um, sky or cloud rune is a clutch option, in my opinion. In most cases... Being able to negate just one hit per short rest uh, using your reaction is somewhat irrelevant and low impact. But when you most need it, or some of your allies, uh, for example, you yourself or a life cleric with low hit points to not get hit, this rune can certainly save your and your allies' ass. Uh, skill advantages might be marginally better compared to frost rune. Uh, but overall, this wouldn't be my first pick either. Uh, now, Stein, Stain, or Stone Rune. Uh, Non-combat utility largely depends on your racial choices. Racial choice, right? If you picked good old variant human, and or any other race that doesn't naturally come with Dark Vision, uh, this rune should be at, or at least near the top of your priorities. The advantage on insight uh, is also nice when interacting with NPCs monsters. However, the real kicker is the save or suck uh, charm effect. Now, despite there being two obvious roadblocks, the first one being the monster just succeeds on the wisdom saving throw, and the second one, the monster just might be immune to the charm condition, you can still completely remove one tough enemy from combat or at the very least, seriously postpone the hostilities for a round or two. Sometimes all you need is for one or two monsters to not swing for a round or two. So this can be quite a potent action action economy equalizer, at least that's, where, that's the way I see it. It's a high risk, high reward type of uh, benefit, but when it gets through, when the monster fails... Boy, it's potent. Uh, finally, we have the Uvar, Uvar, whatever it's pronounced, Storm Rune. Uh, gives you a finer understanding of everything arcane, obviously. Advantage on Ar Arcana uh, checks. Uh, but 
Also gives you a heightened state of vigilance as you cannot be surprised as long as you are not incapacitated. Uh, its combat effect varies in, potenc in potency, but once per short rest and for a full minute, uh, you gain a special reaction that imposes advantage or disadvantage on other creatures' attack rolls, saving throws, or ability checks. This can easily synergize with, for example, your party rogue's sneak attack. You give your rogue advantage on its one attack roll, meaning it's more likely to hit, more likely to deal damage. Or a wizard casting whole person or whole monster or any spell with a saving throw mechanic so then you give the enemy the target of the spell disadvantage on the saving throw or maybe even affect the grapple contest in some way by either giving your ally advantage on their athletics check or maybe giving the enemy disadvantage on their athletics or acrobatics skill check uh, this might legitimately be one of the best options or probably the best option due to how versatile it is like there are so many cases and party compositions and scenarios and circumstances where you being being able to use your reaction for a full minute to give advantage or disadvantage on all three core types of uh, of, of d20 roles in the game uh, and if you ask me you definitely cannot go wrong learning it before any of the other uh, six runes now you know all of this is fun and dandy you know cool but it feels like something is missing and yeah you're right but nothing is missing because we have another level three feature called giant might and you know if you're thinking again that you know whatever battle master is still better compared to all of these runes i would I, I would Im I would implore you to think again uh, on top of the two runes that you learn right away at level three which you can you immediately gain their uh, permanent benefits and on top of that their once per short rest uh, boon uh, you also gain this giant mind feature which ob obviously gives you very decent uh, bonuses as well uh, twice per long rest you can change your size category you can become large for one minute Providing advantage on strength checks, saving throws, uh, as well as increasing your weapon attack damage by 1d6. So, by default, you can be as good as, at grappling as any barbarian. But, if the prospect of wrestling foul smelly monsters doesn't appeal to you, your oversized bow is basically a mobile ballista. Uh, so, the enemy will definitely feel your shots. Uh, the long rest, twice per long rest, might be a bit of a tricky issue in co in heavy combat-oriented campaigns where DMs make it a point to run at least four to six combat encounters per adventuring day, especially like in uh, in dungeon crawls and stuff like that. But more um, more uh, more, uh, let's say, veteran veteran players, players more experienced with the system will definitely know when to go with the you know enlargement and when not to for newer players that type of scenario might be a bit challenging but even even then like at least in two combats per adventuring day you will be significantly more effective uh, and you the only the only issue is the timing right so that's pretty much the only thing that you have to that you have to uh, care of at level 7 you get defensive runes, or which magically increase the AC of your allies uh, for a few moments, basically using your reaction, right? It also uses your intelligence modifier to, de to determine this bonus, so this is another feature that keys off your intelligence. But, again, even if you dump your intelligence, it will still be at least plus 2. Options that use all of your action economy are always welcome, in my opinion, and, you know... On the other hand, if you are more into just being awesome by yourself, you also learn one more rune, right? So you get a third rune that you that you learn. So you know, if you just if you weren't sure which which two to pick from these like six, uh, now you get a third one, so you can breathe a little bit easier. And level seven is not that high. It's it's conceivable and it's quite expected that you will at least get to level seven 
uh, in your character progression. So you will be quite actually quite versatile in, in terms of the stuff that you can do. Um, so yeah, that's pretty all nice and dandy, but great stature, a level 10 feature. Um, I can't help but like when I read this feature, I can't help but think whether this feature can turn a halfling or a, a gnome into a medium-sized creature effectively, right? I mean, potentially 12 inches higher is a whole one foot. And they'd probably gain some weight in the process and some mas muscle mass. Making them much closer in height and mass, and mass to dwarves. And dwarves are actually, you know, they are considered medium-sized race, right? Um, but all of that on the side, regardless of all that, you'll probably make yourself big many times before you get this feature you know you you can make yourself big starting from level three uh, so the giant might damage uh, will increase slightly and you will learn one more rune which makes perfect sense in terms of what your character does anyway you know at 10 levels into your character progression you should have some mechanical bonus you know for just being you right at level 15 rune magic mastery all of your runes are now twice per short rest uh, and you gain one more rune so at level 10 you gain the fourth one and now at level 15 you finally get the fifth and last one uh, the two two times per short rest is this is a in my opinion a major power bump both in terms of versatility you already have it, uh, even even at lower levels. But now you all of those versatile things that you can do, you can use twice per short rest. So this really becomes uh, quite a potent thing. And considering the fact that you have, you know, five out of these six, yeah, that's uh, that's 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 pretty nuts. Uh, finally, at level eighteen, you get blessing of the old father. Uh, going back to the good old uh, giant lore of the old father and all that fine and dandy stuff uh, not in, in in order not to get too much into that it's probably fun at first but being the biggest one of the bunch kind of quickly gets old you know you can only invoke you know the, i'm the biggest one of, of us all or of you all uh, tricks so long before it kind of like gets uh, you know you become a one trick pony so to avoid loneliness at high elevations, you can now resize one of your allies as well. And as a rule of thumb, anybody with extra attack is a good choice because they will be gaining a bonus to their damage equal to 1d8. So you know if they if they swing, so uh, they deal more damage. It's always good. Uh, you can't go wrong with barbarians, you know, paladins, whatever. Uh, in terms of overall power and mechanical benefits of this subclass. Uh, I would sort of put it in somewhere in the middle of the pack, you know, I would consider consider it a middle of the pack option for fighters. Battlemaster, Eldritch Knight and Cavalier are still the top three prospects in my book, but Rune Knight definitely feels superior to Champion, to Purple Dragon Knight uh, and uh, what's the other one? Arcane Archer, right, yeah, so... Um, it kind of feels on par with the samurai, you know, obviously there are different subclasses, but, you know, there's a asymmetrical balance in the game, that's kind of like the guiding principle behind the design of these subclasses, and overall when I consider all of the features from the rune knight and samurai, they kind of feel similar in terms of the overall power, so if this subclass ever gets... Uh, released in in its current iteration i don't think it will be particularly overpowered because it doesn't feel like that like so to me but i feel like it's gonna be interesting and mechanically effective enough that people will definitely play it and if you are the one whose dm allows uh, unearthed arcana material played as content definitely you know this is an interesting option to pick if you are into fighters uh, with that said, let's go into the ranger archetype, the swarm keeper. As the name suggests, these rangers are somewhat akin to shepherd druids. They enjoy the company of face swarms, forming a unique symbio uh, symbiosis with the spirits of the wild. Swarm keeper magic at level 3 right away. Rangers learn a unique version of the mage hand cantrip. 
manifesting their fine bond and control over the swarms which uh, they are obvi obviously always surrounded by. Uh, the extra spells uh, they learn follow the now basically established new new but established ranger design path introduced uh, with uh, Xanatar's Guide to Everything. So basically like going back to, the, to Gloomstalker and some of these other rangers introduced in Xanatar's Guide, they do get more spells that they learn, uh, which obviously addresses one of the key one one of the core issues with ranger it's the lack of known spells um and obviously creates a much clearer clearer distinction between the archetypes uh, of each ranger subclass right uh fairy fire is the first one on the swarm keepers list um it's a very solid uh, first level uh, support spell web is mechanically a strict upgrade over fairy fire I would say uh, because the restraint condition not only uh, gives advantage on your attack rolls but also gives disadvantage on enemies attack rolls and obviously you know uh, tilts the scale in your party favor um, Gaseous form opens up a new mobility options uh, and the way I see this like in terms of flavor theme vibe I kind of see this spell, you know, obviously mechanically providing you advantages it provides, but the more the, the way I see it is like less of a gaseous form, more like a swarm. You basically become one with the swarm, but you know, mechanically definitely new mobility options as well as a you know panic button escape option for when you and or your party get neck deep into trouble. Uh, giant insect can tilt the action economy in your favor you know if everything else fails uh you always just like you deploy a couple of these centipedes spiders you know wa wasps or scorpions uh just like to equalize the action economy um uh, insect plague another one another spell that makes kind of like perfect thematic sense similar to giant insect um this is after all like a swarm uh, a swarm a swarm thingy so insect plague definitely makes perfect thematic sense though it's not nearly as good on a 17th level character that is ranger that gets a fifth level spell like this as is on a level 9 druid cleric or sorcerer uh, still even at level 17 you might get two bursts of damage out of it uh, one when you cast a spell uh, and another one when the creature ends its turn inside with a spell but you will most likely have to cooperate with other casters in your party to accomplish that task successfully. Um, at lower levels, at level 9, it is somewhat conceivable that the creature might just be stuck inside of the area of this spell for a round. But at higher levels, creatures have more than 40 movement speed, so they can easily get out of the area of effect. So 40-10 piercing damage doesn't seem like much and only like a temporary bump in the road for most creatures. That said, you know, usually there's at least one more spellcaster in your party. Usually it's a, it's a full caster, a cleric, a wizard or somebody else. And you can cooperate with them uh, using this spell. Now, get, 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 gathered... Uh, English, motherfucker, do you speak it? Gathered Swarm, a feature that offers a minor damage bump akin to Horizon, Horizon Walker um, Ranger. Now, the damage die is one category lower compared to Horizon Walker. Horizon Walker has a D8, while this one has a, a D6. But, um, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the option to kind of like affect the target's positioning... And potentially getting out of out of its reach or pulling the target closer for your melee barbarians and paladins in a party to unload big dick damage is a nice thing, you know. The damage isn't that impactful anyway, but the fact that you can kind of affect the battlefield uh, in one in in a, in a slight fashion might be quite quite a good feature, especially at level three, but in any way, shape, or form at any level, right? Um, at level 7, uh, writhing, writhing, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, I should probably google translate these things so that I can, I can know how, how to pronounce these things, but anyway, yeah, at level 7, your swarm bond becomes more refined, the extra movement speed plus climbing speed and a bonus action disengage are something you will rely on most often, 
essentially you get half of monks unarmored movement improvement but two levels earlier than the oriental speed demons get they get it at level nine you sort of get it at level uh two you you with this feature you cannot walk on water so you're not jesus but you're kind of halfway through right uh the minor flying plus hover speed can be equally useful against melee only enemies as well as exploration and survival scenarios at level 11 on top of the increase in damage uh, you also get the scuttling eyes a feature resembling find familiar spell in to some extent but it neatly ties into the overall swarm theme of the subclass uh, its limited duration is compensated by versatile mobility and the fact it keys off of your own features and bonuses uses your own senses you can telepathically communicate with it uh, whatever whatever right uh, at the very least, the Alpha Faith spirit from your swarm can always scout ahead, regardless of terrain. It it has all of the movement, <laughs> like it can walk, climb, fly, or swim. So pretty much anything. Um, the option to have more than one use per long rest is neat, though a third level slot might be a too a bit too much of an expense. Uh, second level slot seems more appropriate for the level of utility you get out of this feature you know i don't think it's it's too much of an investment to expect a character 11th level character to spend a third level slot for something like this because it does offer quite a bit quite an extensive utility but a second level might be more appropriate you know just in terms of rangers being overall weak and than like expecting them to waste one of their precious resources on something that may or may not yield any beneficial result you know the the, the thing just might die if you fail a wisdom saving throw uh, yeah i mean second level might be more appropriate at level 15 you get the storm of minions which is a feature that requires an action uh and gives you a minute long spell like area of effect that has a little bit of everything it has a little bit of damage uh it has a little bit of a self-heal uh it provides blinded condition to the enemy that fails a saving throw um the con, con saving throw up oh, it, it gives you the option to ignore allies so yeah it, like you don't have to even affect your allies so you don't have to worry about their barbarians and paladins being up there in the monster spaces um and you know, most importantly, it doesn't require concentration to keep up for a full minute. Uh, and obviously, you can use your bonus action on subsequent turns to move it, move this sphere up to 30 feet. Uh, all of that is good. These effects are certainly decent altogether when used for free, and you do get one use of this feature for free. Uh, per long rest similar to your scuttling eyes. It's both of these are once per long rest features however This feature also kind of like follows the similar principle of using one of your highest level slots In this case for in this case fourth level is your highest level slot at level 15 You need two more levels to get fifth level slots um, and in in that regard, you know sure the first time you use it. It's it's good. It's amazing but you know i don't think the feature would be broken if it could be reused with one level lower spell slot the radius and damage are rather small healing even smaller there's a higher chance monsters will be immune to blinded condition at level 15 and even if they are not they probably have legendary resistances and the the bonus section 30 feet movement of the sphere can be outrun by many higher challenge rating monsters on the other hand, uh, considering the ranger class as a whole, lowering the spell, sl spell slot requirements for these two features um, might be a tad too much, might prove, might make this subclass a bit too, maybe a bit, a bit more powerful than all other subclasses currently officially in the game. So, you know, but it does render all of your level 3 and 4 spells, you know, like sort of inferior in that case maybe you know it might be the case you know it's really tough to say but one thing's clear if you ask me the subclass doesn't look and feel more powerful than the ones released in sanatars 
Senator's Guide to Everything, uh, the distinct flavor and fun factor are definitely there though. So if it ever gets released in its current iteration, I don't think it will be any anything more powerful than what we currently have in game. It will be quite effective at what it does, but you know other classes have things that they uh, have things uh, that, that 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 are effective on, on in 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 their uh, class abilities and features. Like Master Slayer is pretty good on its own with spells and all of, all of, all of the other features. So yeah, I mean I don't think it will be more powerful, for example, than Monster Slayer, which is, in its own regard, pretty powerful a uh, subclass, and it's official one, uh, it's been released in Sonatars. Anyway, uh, with that said about Ranger, let's go into the final subclass in, in this Unearthed Arcana. Roguish Archetype, the Revived, um, Mysterious Origins of this Roguish Archetype, sort of mysterious, you know, based on reading this little bit of a flavor here. Um, can actually be easily explained by any level 5 cleric casting Revivify on you or any other character, any other rogue, you know, multiple times. Uh, fact of the matter is, even in high fantasy worlds of Dungeons and Dragons, there is a bit of a mystery surrounding existence beyond the point of physical death. Maybe you were just an ordinary farmer Bob, whose soul for some reason experienced prolonged direct meddling uh, by unfathomable powers, de deities, you know, patrons, demigods, who knows. So here you are, your soul so tempered with that you've become something more, someone who's basically forced to take up the life of, of an adventuring murder hobo to figure out what the heck is even going on, right? So right away at level 3 you get 3 features. That's quite a lot, and they're quite powerful, you know. But, so let's go over each and every one of them um, individually. So, for example, Tokens of Past life, Lives. Uh, this feature is low-key nuts and somewhat lackluster, if you ask me. First thing that pops to my mind is unclear interaction with Rogue's core feature, Expertise, which they get at level 1, and then they, they get uh, one more use of it at level 6. Uh, expertise, right, uh, it gives you, it doubles your proficiency bonus uh, with all of the skills and tools, or thieves tools, obviously, specifically, that you're proficient in. Um, what happens if you choose, at level 6, for example, if you choose one of your skill proficiencies that you get, just like temporarily get from your tokens of past lives, you just choose that skill proficiency for that day, and then you hit level 6, and then you choose that particular skill proficiency as your expertise skill proficiency and then on some other day you choose to swap that skill with some other skill do you lose expertise when you decide to stop being proficient in that chosen skill tomorrow or any other day or can you only benefit from the expertise while being proficient on the particular day that you choose that particular specific skill or do you retain your expertise across all skills that you, I, it's it's a mess, right? So regardless of that sage advice worthy issue, this rogue can have the best skills or tools for the day. Need to go out in the wilderness, take a day off and dream yourself into survival or animal handling proficiency. Your party just killed a purple worm, but nobody has proficiency with poisoner's kit to extract some some of that sweet 12d6 poison damage. No problem, just spend some time in your bedroll and have some trippy dreams about the purple worm's poison glands or whatever. Whatever you need for the next day you can have, right? So, this feature possesses a certain DM versus player, if not even a bit of a metagaming meta quality, metagaming baggage. How aware is the actual in-game character of, the, of this mechanical benefit. Even though you as a player can definitely unambiguously and clearly choose the skill or tool proficiency, does it mean that the character that you're playing is aware of that thing as well? Uh, it's not entirely clear to me, you know. It, you might be reading into this as a ru 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 rules lawyer and say, whatever it says, you choose the skill, therefore you can do whatever you want. But... Should it be so? Should it actually be like that, right? Do you actually have so much control over what 
you get out of your dreams and past lives right away at level 3. I don't know. It's a it's a it's a topic of discussion, right? Me personally, I'd like to see this feature completely redesigned. The way it's currently done is too generic, offers no context, and instead of being able to choose any skill or, or tool, a table, for example, similar to some higher level features, for example, connect with the dead more connect with the dead more on that later. Uh, a table with 6 to 10 predetermined options would be more in the spirit of 5th edition Dungeons and & Dragons and would definitely help further define the backstory of the character. Maybe you were a noble in one of your past lives, so you would be able to choose from uh, charisma-based skills such as persuasion and deception, or maybe just a musical instrument proficiency. Or maybe you were a sage providing you with a choice of intelligence-based skills such as history, religion or nature, and tools like cartography, alchemy or calligraphy. Whatever, you know, something that makes sense, you know, maybe it's just like a random table similar to this one. Um, something that kind of, you know, you don't have exact control over, but you can affect with your own rolls. So there's a little bit of a luck, you know, rolling the dice and all of that stuff, all of that fun stuff that... Uh, makes the game uh, more engaging and more interesting. Something to that sort, you know, something that you don't have exact control, fine control over. Something that you kind of like have to deal with based on what you get. Uh, Revive Nature, or another, like a, a second level 3 feature. Uh, a much more straightforward feature right off the bat. It provides three very thematic and mechanically very relevant benefits. Advantage on saves against disease doesn't come up that often in my own experience playing playing the game, even on higher levels. But advantage against poison condition, as well as poison damage resistance, will most likely pop up here and there during the actual gameplay, especially if you play this particular subclass for more than like just a couple of sessions. Uh, not having to eat, drink, breathe, or even sleep at lower levels isn't unheard of. There are, after all, after all uh, races such as Warforge and Elves who get some or even all of these uh, things uh, in their traits. Um, and Warforge is gonna soon become official race uh, after in, in just like two or three days. Um, so, yeah, still using it, uh, using this particular subclass in survival oriented settings, campaigns, scenarios. Uh, is a significant quality of life improvement, it's at least in my opinion, right? Uh, finally, at level 3 you get a third level 3 feature. As if all of these proficiencies that you have very fine and precise control over and all of these superbly, you know, survival, survivable benefits, as if all of that is not enough, uh, you get one more flashy feature on top of all of that. So basically all rogues suffer from one common issue. If you miss with your one attack roll that you get using your attack action, say goodbye to that juicy sneak attack damage. Uh, with this feature, with this level 3 feature, you basically get one more chance at landing your sneak attack damage. So you get additional bonus action attack roll, you only, the only thing you need to do is use your cunning action, which you will most likely use anyway, so you use your cunning action to hide, and then on top of that, you hide behind like a wall or a tree, and then use, you get a ranged spell attack with a short range, but still it's a ranged attack roll, meaning that you most likely have advantage because you just use the hide action immediately after, right? Um... And then, obviously, you know, if you hit with advantage, which is more likely to happen than not, um, you get to just immediately add your sneak attack damage, and it, it's a necrotic type of damage. So, you know, even if the monster is resistant to non-magic, slashing, piercing, or whatever, uh, bludgeoning damage, it's, it's less likely to be resistant or immune to necrotic damage on top of that as well, right? Especially at level 3. Um... So, you know, on top of all of that, you use your dexterity, which is slightly weird, if you ask me. You know, in my opinion, the fact that this is a ranged spell attack, 
Um, it's written somewhere in there. I'm not sure where. Yeah, range spell attack. It should definitely, uh, you know, use intelligence because first and foremost, rogues are one of the saving throws that rogues get are intelligence saving throws. And then on top of that, uh, you know, you get a level nine subclass feature uh, called Connect with the Dead, which uses your intelligence to cast Speak with the Dead. A special version of the Speak with Dead spell, again, which uses your intelligence uh, ability score. Uh, that said, you know, talking more about this level 9 feature, it, it doesn't come out, it's not entirely without fault either. After, you know, after casting the Speak with Dead spell, you randomly gain one of these three uh, benefits. You get either one language, one skill or tool, or one saving throw proficiency, but once the result is randomly determined, you can still choose precisely which language, precisely which skill or tool or precisely which saving throw you get. Okay, well, you're level 9, maybe you should get a modicum of control over what you get. But, you know, even if we, if we ignore that part, uh, you, get, you get the fact that this is a short rest feature. So, meaning that you will potentially and probably inevitably at some point after you get this feature just... You know, spend a couple of short rests because before you get the outcome that you that you desire. So to avoid players sooner or later inevitably resorting to these cheese mechanics, sitting around doing nothing but short resting for a couple of hours, uh, I would instead redesign this feature, make it first and foremost make it only a long rest, but uh, allow the players. A couple chances at actually getting the 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 result they want, if they if they choose to gamble with uh, with one of the three options. So, you know, I would limit it. I would simply limit the amount of uses, the amount of times you can cast to speak with that spell, based on your intelligence modifier. It's not the first time the higher level features go off of your spell casting ability modifier. So this definitely would fall into the you know, uh, kind of things that we, that we already have in the game. Combined with tokens of past lives, uh, this subclass, this feature just seems too generic and a collection of promising features, obviously, you know, that haven't been thought out too deeply and, and carefully designed. But let's explore other two features that we have on our hands. Audience with, audience with death. A level 13 feature uh, gives you advantage on death saving throws is thematically and mechanically quite meaningful even though it's a fairly high level feature but I'm not sure what to think of this kind of like uh, the fact that you gain quote permission end quote to change your personality traits ideals bonds and flaws now for some reason I'm actually making quotes with my fingers in real life I don't know why I'm doing that you can't see me Doing this, but anyway, um, <laughs> on one hand, I can fully understand the idea behind this feature, you know. It makes sense from the perspective of a character that's so intricately uh, bonded, connected with the aspect of death, with the principle of death, with the death itself. Uh, and, you know, you dying and coming back to life, you know, obviously unlocked some unintended consequences that you kind of have a modicum of control over, maybe. At level 13, you maybe should gain some control over what happens every time you make a saving throw or get dropped to zero hit points. However, modifying or even completely changing the snippets of text in those four roleplay boxes, as I like to call them, has been something I've been personally doing for all of my characters so far, especially when faced with tough moral, ethical, or other thought-provoking issues that slowly affect their disposition and their behavior. And particularly when, on occasions, some of my characters died and got brought back to life. They came back, but they were never the same mentally, physically, you know, mentally, psychologically, or even emo em emotionally. And I bet that that's how most other people play their characters too. You start with one set of one set of traits, bonds, ideals, and flaws at the beginning of your adventuring, whatever character career, and sooner or later you modify, change some or even all of these characteristics, 
uh, you know, just based on the fact what, what is going on currently in the campaign, you know. You allow the campaign, the circumstances, the scenarios, the the events, whatever happens in the campaign to affect your character, to change the behavior, the characteristics of your uh, character. So, in a way, it's completely redundant that this feature gives the players the option to change their behaviors and characteristics, you know, based on dropping to zero hit points, you know, and not dying. It's something that, in my opinion, I, you, everybody can always do. Like, there's... I don't think there's any rule in the game that says you cannot change your pers like characteristics, personalities, you know, traits, bonds, flaws. You can just change those things, you know, based on what's happening. I mean, heck, you don't even have to have those at the beginning of your character. You can just leave those blank and figure that stuff along the road, you know. Um, that's sometimes how I do some of my characters, you know. I just, I make them mechanically. I have a vague idea of what I want to do with them, but... I don't really know exactly how they behave or what happens wh when something happens in the game. So, in a way, like, I it's, it's kind of redundant, if you ask me. And what I'd personally like to see is another table, right? We already have one table with this subclass, so it's a level 9 feature. I would like to see a table for level 3, and at level 13 I would pretty much prefer... I mean, heck, go with the 1D100 table. There's... There's already a precedent in the game, uh, um, Wild, Wild Sorcerer is a, a 1D100 table, completely random type of class. So why not have something completely random as well? I mean, you can have good outcomes, you can have bad outcomes, you know, additions, changes, modifications to existing sets of character traits. At least that way, you know, by having the table and forcing the character to, to roll 1D100 on the table, it would be strictly defined and not something that, in my opinion, most people interesting in that sort of, you know, character progression would do anyway. You know, with or without this feature allowing you to do so, you would probably, you know, ask a DM, Hey DM, can I actually change my character a little bit to uh, more, um, you know, more to reflect what happened in the campaign so far? And most DMs will let you do it anyway, you know. So, most people would do it anyway, but the people who don't care about that type of stuff, you know, uh, they, they don't care at all, they're just there to roll some dice, because those players sadly exist, um, you know, you know, they would be thinking it's optional, I don't have to do it, therefore I won't ever do it, why would I even bother? So I, I do think a table would definitely put things at the equal playing ground, you know, playing field. Uh, with that, or with all of that said, let's talk about the level 17 feature. Level 17 feature, Ethereal Jaunt, uh, which is basically, the way I read this feature is uh, kind of a spell mastery, a wizard picking Misty Step, a second level wizard spell, as one of its two spell mastery spells. You sort of get an improved version of the spell, you know, kind of, because you don't have to see where you are trying to teleport and you get it one level earlier at level 17 compared to wizards in most cases it's better because you don't have to see but when dealing with spells like you know uh, wall of force or force cage or any other spell that affects ethereal plane travel or any other you know teleport that goes through these magical f barriers and stuff like that it's worse because uh, it, uh, it automatically it automatically fails. English, speak it. Regardless of that, unlimited at will teleportation is super potent at any level, especially when it ties so neatly into the character's pre-existing action economy. One more thing that I'd like to mention is that it's not entirely clear whether anti-magic field stops this feature. Now it does say that you know waste it wastes your bonus action if you attempt to teleport through magical force does that mean that this is a magical feature i mean it does by the definition of the sage compendium jeremy crawford have the word magical in its description however based on the context i'm not entirely sure because it it references magical force it doesn't reference that the feature itself is ma i I don't know, it's something that probably needs uh, some 
clarification in sage advice or uh, or some of those compendiums er erratas whatever you know it needs to be more clearly defined in my opinion uh, but that's why we have these playtest materials so we as players can actually provide feedback to the designers um, so Jeremy Crawford if you're watching my video you fucking know my opinion I need I, I think you need to be more clear on these things overall I like the concept behind the subclass, but in my opinion, it feels too generic and watered down in its current iteration. It needs more work if it gets made official. And with that said, I would kind of conclude this video. Uh, it sort of falls in a general length of these uh, videos that I've been making lately about these unearthed arcana subclasses that we got. That, we, that will also include probably the uh, last and final unearthed arcana which uh, provided playtest material for you know subclass playtest material for uh, each class in the game uh, there is uh, obviously artificer which is which has been released at the beginning of this year but in three days it's gonna be made official so at some point i'm probably gonna make uh overview review video about the official class as a whole there is no reason for me to rush into that uh, at this point if you like this video, if you like me doing these types of videos in, in general, like, share, comment, subscribe, hit the bell button. You know the YouTube drill. This is probably not your first video watching on my channel. Um, so every little bit of interaction with my videos with my channel helps. Uh, if you can be bothered, if you can just spare one little tiny itty bitty clip, click, I would be eternally grateful to you because it definitely does help grow my channel. So, with that said, I will uh, once again uh, invite you to consider if you uh, consider me worth your money, time, trouble, whatever you consider me worthy of, to chuck a buck my way on my Patreon page. Again, it's not mandatory, it's optional, but the option is always there. So, if you're interested, once again, consider it. With that said, again, I'm li I sound like a broken record, but I will... Uh, re um, Reiterate, like, share, comment, subscribe, hit the bell button, and with that said, Min Max Munch King out, and uh, talk to you very, very soon.